Our song of preparation is number 485. 485, Like a River Glorious. Let's stand and sing these three stanzas. For tonight's sermon on the fruit of the Spirit, peace, we're going to read together Psalm 46. Psalm 46 in your pew Bibles. And just a note, the sermon I've written here and prepared, the uh, verses are from the NIV, so if there's a little variation in the sermon itself, just forgive that. And uh, as always, keep your Bibles open with you as we'll go through this psalm, especially the second point. I focus quite a bit on the psalm itself and into the third point, but... Uh, um, just uh, again, just a little heads up as far as that goes. So Psalm 46, this is God's inspired word. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob 
is our refuge. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. <clears throat> Beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would guess that it's a little bit difficult to talk about peace or even visualize what peace may look like or even think about what peace may feel like when all of around us and even within there is a presence of, of conflict and strife. There's the presence of unrest and, and turmoil. In fact, I, I dare say that the presence of conflict and strife in our everyday existence is so real, it, it's so constant, uh, that sometimes we think that that's the norm. And we come to the point where we accept that conflict and strife are sort of our, our natural state, and that peace, well, that's sort of a bridge too far. That's something that's not attainable in this life or in this world. And I think it's especially telling when someone dies that we often refer to them as finally finding rest or maybe uh, being at peace. But is that really the case? Do we have to wait until we die uh, to finally find that kind of peace? Now, in the psalm we read a moment ago, the psalmist speaks of, of conflict, the presence of hostility and unrest and upheaval in our world. It describes it in several ways. Uh, we'll talk about this more in, later on, but how the earth gives way, the mountains fall into the, uh, the hearts of the sea they, with the quaking and surging, the waters of the sea roaring and foaming, the nations are in uproar, and of course the kingdoms fall. In short, we would say it this way, there's unrest all around us. There's seemingly chaos in the world. We see it in politics. We see it in and current events, if you've been paying attention to Fox News the last 24 hours, you know about some of these current events and the turmoil in our world. I think it was in El Paso, Texas at a Walmart. I don't know how many people were shot, but at least 20 died. That Maybe the death toll's gone up by now. Um, then over in, I think it was Dayton, Ohio, another mass shooting. Uh, nine, at least nine people dead there also. So again, these are things that uh, just are mind-boggling to think about that someone would do this, but it's, uh, it's the way of the world which we live right now. More and more these terrible things happening, the unrest, the chaos. Uh, uh, we see conflict, don't we, in, in so many issues, even politically, uh, moral issues, social issues. There's conflict and even hostilities in personal relationships, within marriages within families. And of course, there's conflict and strife also present in the church. I made mention of that earlier before the scripture reading about what Paul was writing here in Galatians 5, that he did so in the context of the inner turmoil going on in the church, that some of those believers had fallen back to the ways of Judaism, and that formed a division, uh, uh, a problems uh, between the believers in the church. In fact, in Galatians 5.15, he mentions how the members of the church were biting and devouring each other. Again, those are the words of the, the NIV. In verse 20, he mentions discord and dissensions and factions among the sins of the flesh. Now, whether that discord, whether that conflict was a result of those theological differences, that theological division, or whether it was a result of something else we really don't know. Maybe it was a, a combination of all of this, but it really doesn't matter. The point is, even among Christians, those who call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, there is the presence of, of conflict, of, of unrest. So obviously, not even those who call themselves Christians can live in, in perfect peace. So again, we come back and ask, is there no hope? Is there no way of finding peace in this world? Is there no refuge, no sanctuary from this unending conflict and hostility? Well, Psalm 46 says there is. And Galatians 5.22, the Apostle Paul speaks of peace as a third manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, which means peace is not only possible, but peace is a reality. It's a reality for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this afternoon we'll look at what this peace is and how it is to be made manifest in our hearts and lives. Here God calls us to peace in a world of unrest. God calls us to peace in a world of unrest. Notice first of all the God of peace, secondly the Prince of Peace, and thirdly the people of peace. It should be easy enough to remember the God of peace, the Prince of Peace, and the people of peace. And just a word um, on the audio. Can you, can you hear me all right? I'm used to hearing something of a reverb coming back to me, but how about in the back row? Can you guys hear me okay? 
Very good. All right, that's great. First of all, the God of peace. And before I get too far into this first point, just a few words about peace in general. Uh, we Christians, I, I think we know this, we're not the only ones in the world who are searching for peace or, or talking about the need for peace. Certainly that's going on in politics right now, in the political realm. A lot of people taking shots at Donald Trump saying it's his fault for these shootings. And how do we find peace, even if it's not political? How do we find peace in this crazy world in which we live? Uh, we know that other world religions highlight the need for peace as well. Uh, Buddhism, what is that but a search for inner peace? And many cults as well find the ultimate end in some kind of peace. And culturally speaking, this is a, a huge issue. It's a very popular subject. I, I look around, I think there's more people in my church my age, but I refer to the hippie generation. I saw a lot of heads nodding. I don't know how many of you were alive and maybe Mitch, <laughs> the hippie generation. We kind of know what that was like. But um, uh, that was during the time when they, the songs were written um, that were all anti-war songs. But it was especially John Lennon's song, Imagine, that really captured or epitomized the mindset of, of that particular generation. And some of you might know the, the lyrics to that, but he writes this song, Imagine a world, in a, in a sense, with no conflict. And he says, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine a day when all the world would live as one. Imagine all the people living in peace. Oh, as ironic as this might sound, the truth is, there are conflicting notions, <laughs> conflicting notions about what peace is, and conflicting notions about how to attain this peace. So it leads us to ask right away in the sermon, well, what exactly is peace? What, what are we after? What are we looking for? I, is peace merely the cessation of wars? Is peace the removal of, of all that which divides us? I, is peace attained? simply by disarming the powerful nations, taking all the guns away, and having people just sort of forcing them to, to agree to do whatever it takes to get along? Will that accomplish peace? And as Christians, we should ask as well, is this the kind of peace that the Bible talks about? Is, is that the kind of peace that God seeks to bring about within us and within his world? So these are the things we'll be looking at this afternoon together. And the first thing we need to understand then about peace at least looking at it from the way the Bible looks at it, is that peace, much like joy, one of the fruit of the Spirit that I preached on earlier, not here, but uh, at, at Calgary, but uh, much like joy, it's, it's an emotion. It's more than that, but it is at least an emotion. Someone described peace as that satisfying feeling of inner tranquility, of, of really inner rest, which comes to us when we find our lives are well-ordered. Right, when everything's in order and everything's um, going well and there's no chaos or tumult, we say, well, yeah, I've got a tranquil spirit. Things are settled. Things, things are good right now. And while that's, I think, a good place to start, we have to go further than that. We also want to add that peace is a state of being. Uh, peace is not only an emotion, but it is an attitude even stronger. It's an objective reality. It's a disposition of our soul that doesn't vary. And boys and girls, I know I've used a lot of hard words here to um, help us understand this, but if I could talk about maybe in contrast to a mood, you know, when we get up in the morning, say maybe, um, well, maybe mom's in a bad mood or maybe dad's in a bad mood, maybe they're not morning people, right? Our mood can change depending on the time of day, depending on the circumstances in life. Uh, when the Chicago Cubs lose a baseball game, I'm not always in a very good mood right after that. It doesn't take me long to get out of that. It used to be much worse, especially when the Bears play. That would kind of ruin the afternoon. But I've gotten over that, too, and 20 years ago. Now the Bears can lose, and I'm not upset at all. But our moods change with the circumstances. Our moods change when, things do, when people do things to us or maybe say things to us. Our mood can change just like that. Uh, you wake up, for example, it's raining. Your mood changes, perhaps. But again, peace shouldn't be like that. Uh, peace true peace anyway, does not come and go. It, it doesn't vary depending upon what is happening in our lives around us or even in the world around us. Instead, think of this, peace is static. Peace remains. Peace abides. We can still experience peace in the midst of all that we're going through. Trials, difficulties, whatever circumstances might be, 
we should be able to say we're still at peace and we possess peace when everything in our life perhaps is, is, is falling apart. And you know that, you know what it's like to have a bad day or a bad week or even a bad month, whether it's at home, at school, at work, whatever that might be. You could still have peace or we ought to have peace even going through that. It's like uh, the song we'll sing in a moment when peace like a river, right? When we're being tossed about by waves of tumult, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Whatever my circumstances in life, thou, you, God, have taught me to say, it is well. It is well. I'm at peace in my soul. And so what I want us to see in this first point, then, is that this longing for peace and that this desire for peace that is shared by all people, that's felt by all people all over the world, in every generation, it proves something. It really proves three things. First of all, that there is a God of peace, who created us, a God of peace. And when God created us, number two, he put his divine peace into us, just like we speak of joy and love. God is all those things, and he, when he created us, he put those things into us. So we have the peace of God within us. So the God of peace made us, and he gave us his peace. And thirdly, when man sinned, sin cut off access to that peace. Sin distorted it. Sin blinded and dulled us. It dulled our senses so that while we, we know that we're missing something in our sinful state, we're too blind. We're too ignorant to find our way back to it, which is so true in the world. You know, again, people are searching for this, but they can't quite put their finger on it. They can't quite find it exactly. It's because they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know the way back. And that's why God gave us his word. That's why God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, to restore that peace, to restore what was lost, to repair what was broken, and to show us the way back. You know, it was Augustine, Augustine who said long ago, and just a, a note about Augustine, boys and girls, you think about people who have lived a long time ago. Augustine lived shortly after the time of Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul. He lived in the year, I think, in the years 300 to 325, maybe 350, right in that time frame, a long, long time ago, long before John Lennon <laughs> and the hippie generation. Well, think, just listen to what he said about this. He said, thou, uh, his words, thou, or Lord, you have made us for yourself. Our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. So even there, Augusta knew the, uh, the secret to peace. Because the God who made us, the God of peace who made us, who put his peace in our heart, he knows, Augustine knew that the only way to find that peace again was to find it in God through Jesus Christ. And so again, outside of Jesus, we will know no peace. And there's many passages in the Bible, too, to prove that God's a God of peace. Uh, just, I can't go through all of them tonight, but Matthew 15, 13, may the God of peace be with you all. Uh, Matthew 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, uh, for God is not a God of disorder, he's not a God of chaos or confusion, but a God of peace. And 1 Corinthians 13, 11, and finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And then, of course, there are all those verses where, as we heard tonight at the beginning of the service, where the Apostle Paul greets the churches to whom he writes, and which we do in church as well. When I, boys and girls, I put up my hands at the beginning of the service, and what do I say? Grace and peace to you. That's how Paul greeted the churches in the New Testament, and that's how we're called to greet God's people as well when we come for worship. And you say, well, how is it then that... Um, that this greeting is given. Why is it given? And on what basis can God give such a blessing? And the why is clear. We've already said that because we're sinners in desperate need of God's grace and peace more than anything else in the world. And on what basis can God give this blessing? On the basis that he is the God of peace who gives peace to his people. And let me just say a word about that too. As the God of peace, we're saying more than he's simply the dispenser of peace. But just like we say that God is love and God is joy and God is, um, God is um, as we'll talk about other things too, God is patience and etc. God is also the God who is peace. He's peace in his inner being. There's peace among the, um, the persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
not a, not a shred of, of divide or, or disagreement or confusion, uh, but only perfect order and harmony, peace and unity. There's a unity of, of being there, a unity of, of purpose and, and will and working. And just one more uh, thing to draw out in this first point. Uh, maybe some of you were thinking about Philippians 4, verse 7, where Paul speaks about that, that peace of God that transcends all understanding and how that guards your hearts and minds. Well, the idea that that peace of God that transcends human understanding, that means that God's peace, like God himself, it, it's, it's incomprehensible. It can't be fully known or fully measured or, or fully fathomed. However, in his great love and mercy, God still gives us this transcendent peace to keep us, to guard us, to help us overcome all that anxiety and the unrest and the tumult of this sinful world that keeps coming up against us. And the last note here is that as a God of peace, God hates. He hates all that threatens to undo this peace. God hates and, and um, opposes everything uh, that brings about strife and, and disorder and division and disunity. God hates all that separates us from him as well in terms of sin. In fact, God hates it so much that he did something about it. <laughs> he did something to ultimately remove the presence of hostility and conflict and strife. God sent his son, the Prince of Peace, into the world to do just that. And that's our second point this afternoon, the, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And here we begin by... Uh, taking a closer look at Psalm 46. Now, this is a psalm that over the generations has been such a great source of comfort and consolation to the church of Jesus Christ, certainly in, in the psalmist's own day and for generations on. And just a word about Martin Luther here, too. This is the psalm upon which Martin Luther based his well-known hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's likely that Martin Luther wrote that song uh, uh, during a very dark and difficult time in his own life and really in the history of Europe. Uh, the song appears, by the way, for the first time around the year 1531, uh, which suggests it could have been written in the years earlier when the Black Plague uh, was uh, afflicting so much of Europe and even threatened uh, Martin Luther's own son. A one church historian uh, wrote that many times during this dark and tumultuous period, when terribly discouraged, Martin Luther would turn to his co-worker, to Philip Melanchthon, and say, Come, Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. It's a psalm we sing in the presence of the darkness of which we live, and it's a song that lifts our hearts again to find where is our hope, where does our help come from, in a sense. I know that's another psalm, but it's the same basic understanding that God is our strength, our fortress. Uh, Luther said of this particular song, We sing this psalm to the praise of God because he is with us and powerfully and miraculously preserves and defends his church and his word against all fanatical spirits, against the gates of hell, against the implacable hatred of the devil, and against all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and sin. So again, in the face of all that darkness and discouragement, Luther found peace in this psalm, the fact that the Lord is our refuge, our strength, a mighty fortress, in his words, a, a bulwark never failing. Therefore, we will not be afraid. And then looking at the psalm in particular, I mentioned at the outset of the sermon, the psalmist speaks of the perils here, of the world that would threaten to undo us. And you think of the, the perils being really in three realms, certainly the realm of creation. He speaks of the mountain surging, uh, of the seas perhaps swallowing us up. And certainly there are dangers also uh, in the human realm. Uh, there's dangers of, of the enemies that Israel knew very well, the enemies that, that came against God's people throughout our history. Uh, God's people uh, faced armies and foes much more powerful than they. You know, you think that going all the way back to David and Goliath, the most obvious mismatch there between David and Goliath. Goliath didn't stand a chance. And of course, as Luther vivid, vividly expressed, there are also dangers and perils in the spiritual realm, as the devil and all of his hosts come up against us. Yet in the face of all these dangers, looking at this psalm, there's one thing, one thing that remains a constant. God is with his people. No matter the size of the army that Israel faced, no matter the strength of the warriors or the skill of the swordsmen, 
or the accuracy of the archers, no matter the, the number of their chariots and horses, Israel always had the advantage. And it was one advantage, again, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, is with us. He's always on the side of his people. Twice in that psalm, we hear that familiar refrain too, verse 7 and 11, uh, refrain, shouted and sung by God's people, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, calling to mind that this is the God who's with them in the past, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We would say today that that same God, uh, spiritually speaking, were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those see who are of the same seed in Christ. Uh, we are those who have that same God as our God. He is with us. And, and look at verse 4, uh, uh, a, a wonderful, a, a beautiful verse in the middle of this psalm. We're told there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. That, that's a beautiful description of peace right there, isn't it? Uh, a peaceful uh, tranquil stream that blesses, that, that refreshes, that comforts the people in that city, the, the people of God. Now that's not a literal stream flowing through the city, but this is a, a spiritual river. This is a spiritual stream that flows out from God, issuing forth from the throne of grace unto God's people. And really it's a, it's a, a river of blessing a river of God's grace and mercy and again, and again his peace. And so already you see the contrast in this psalm. On the one hand, you've got the, the quaking of the mountains, the surging of the mountains, the, the roaring, the foaming of the sea. You've got the tumult of the nations and the, tra the, kings, uh, the kingdoms in conflict, so to speak, on the one hand, but then in the midst of all that, all that chaos and disorder and strife, on the other hand, you have the people of God and they're dwelling in perfect peace. Their attitude and their disposition is one of serenity and security. And verse 5 reminds us why. Because God is within her. <laughs> she will not fail. Unlike the gods of the pagan nations, Israel God, Israel's God was real. Israel's God was alive. We would say the same thing today of all the, the gods and of all the things that people look to for peace and for answers to this or that. It is only one God that reigns supreme, only one God that's the true source of peace that all people need, the God of heaven and earth. And Israel's God had a special name as well called Emmanuel, the God who dwelled, who dwelled in and among his people. And he was the one that the nations particularly feared. If you recall Rahab and Joshua 2, uh, she tells the spies how the fear of the Lord had fallen upon all of Jericho because they'd heard how this was the God who fought for his people. This was the God who defeated single handedly all the enemies of Israel. He drowned Pharaoh and all of his hosts in the Red Sea. He killed Sihon and Og, the king of the Amorites. And he would be the one who would also bring down the walls of Jericho. Only the Lord, God of Israel, to do that. Now, when we talk about God dwelling with his people, that should immediately remind us of God's own son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is identified by John in John chapter 1 as the eternal word of God. That word, uh, that son of God, that word became flesh, John says, and made his dwelling among us. Jesus Christ, God's own son, the Prince of Peace, is a living embodiment of Jehovah God, the, the mighty fortress, our refuge and strength of Psalm 46. And why did Jesus come? Boys and girls, why did Jesus come? If you remember the words of the angel in Matthew, he came to save his people from their sins. But when you're looking at that and say, how would you answer that from Psalm 46? Why did Jesus come? Well, metaphorically speaking, the answer is this, to make wars cease to the ends of the earth to break the bow and shatter the spear, to burn the shields in fire. That's, that's the psalmist's poetic way of saying that Jesus Christ came into this world to end the conflict, to put an end to hostilities, uh, to remove that which divides, and to bring about peace once and for all. And you analyze that from the viewpoint of Jesus' own ministry. Jesus didn't come to this world with an army of angels to fight against all the wicked nations and all the, the corrupt leaders of his, of his day to introduce a world government and usher in an unsurpassed age of peace. 
of world peace. No, Jesus came to do something far more significant and far more necessary, again, for fallen sinners. Jesus came to make peace with God for us. Jesus came to remove that barrier, to remove the great spiritual divide, that chasm that separated an almighty and a holy God from his people who were unholy. Again, Jesus came then to save us from our sins, to reconcile us to God, to make us beloved sons and daughters of God, and again, to make the way back, to make the way back so that we can know peace again and have peace again and see that and, and know it and, and, and feel that within us. I want to have you turn to another passage with me, and you don't have to turn to that. You can read along or listen as I read it here. But it's Ephesians 2, 13 through 17. Ephesians 2, 13 through 17. It's a very, it's an interesting passage, a, a really fascinating passage, especially at this time um, in the history of redemption as uh, the gospel was going out and being preached and churches were being full in some places of both Jews and Gentiles. And you know how that, that people group didn't get along very well between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Jews consider themselves somewhat above that and uh, uh, and didn't always get along well with these new converts especially. But, but Paul tells them now about this, this idea of this new and one humanity in Jesus Christ. And he uses the imagery of peace and the end of hostility. But I want you to notice, as he's talking about these things, uh, indirectly it feeds our point because notice how the peace is won. Notice how the peace is won. He writes, uh, But now in Christ Jesus you who were once far away, being those Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both to them to or both of them to God and here it is through the cross through the cross by which he put to death their hostility and speaking of Jesus Paul writes he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near so of course that's how the peace was won through the cross through Christ's blood Jesus made peace between us and God. He made peace between us and our fellow Christians, Christians of different race and different nationalities and, and cultures and backgrounds. And he did all of that by way of his crucified body, his shed blood on the cross. I thought, too, of what Isaiah 53, verse 5 says of this, that the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his stripes, are we healed. Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace did that for you and for me. He suffered and died that our sins might be paid for, might be removed, and that we would have the free gift of eternal life. But then again, also that peace might be restored. Peace with God. Peace with each other. Peace in the world of chaos and unrest. Peace in the midst of any circumstance in life. And now that is the gift of life. And that is the gift of, of peace which God now proclaims to all the world through the gospel, to all people of all nations, that they too might hear, that they too might be saved, that they might be able to have this same kind of peace that everyone in the world is searching for, but is found only in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Thirdly, then, we come to a people of peace. What kind of people ought we to be? If you look at Psalm 46, I think it puts it very well, although there are many different ways we could answer this question, but uh, it says we should be a still people. A still people. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. To be still means to be quiet. It means to have a stable and, and quiet spirit and trust in God. I thought, too, it means not to complain, not to grumble against God, not to panic, not to be that Christian who every time something bad happens in our world or maybe even in our personal life, we, we lose our perspective, our, our panic meter 
and our blood pressure, anxiety level spikes, and we start doubting God's goodness, or we start doubting his wisdom. Is God really at work in this? We, we start doubting whether he's really sovereign. You know anyone like that? I do. I stare at his face every morning in the mirror. <laughs> I'm one of the worst of those. When things don't go, when things are unrestful or chaotic in my life too, I tend to, to do that, where you're in a little bit of a chaotic situation. You know, you, you start, um, your panic meter strikes, your, your blood pressure increases, and you start wondering, why is this happening? Why is God doing that? And then back to the psalm, back to God's word again. He gave you his peace. He gave you his son, Jesus Christ, the prince of peace. To not be anxious, but to have that peace that passes all understanding. That's how all of this fits together. And so instead of that panic and unrest, instead of maybe even accusing God of being unjust, we're to be still. Maybe better to be unshaken, to be unmoved despite the circumstances, to be unwavering. Another way of saying that, and maybe you've already thought of this, is to be fully trusting in God, uh, to trust God completely in every area of our life, that he's the God of the big things, and often where I struggle is that he's also the God of the little things, and sometimes I like to worry more about those little things and not let God take control of those. But I'm reminded, too, of what Paul says in Romans 8, that this is the God who has already given up, given up for us his only begotten son, a sacrifice, of, a sacrifice of infinite value and worth. And Paul says, if God has already done that for you, then how much more won't he give you all things? That doesn't mean that, uh, that in this world we won't have trouble. It doesn't mean that in this world we won't have want or strife. Uh, much to the contrary. We know we're going to suffer. Jesus said that in this world you will have tribulation. But what Paul is saying in Romans 8 is that in spite of all of that, all the trouble, all the chaos, all that's going on around us in the world and in our lives, that nothing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. I find that in a way, Paul says the very same thing that we hear in Psalm 46. You shall not fear, God is with you. God is within you. He's your rock, your fortress, your strong place. God is with us, and we are with him. And again, that's forever. And Christ's blood has sealed that. So if God already has already given us this, we can know with, beyond a shadow of a doubt he's going to give us all things that we need. He's going to give to us every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. And, and when we think about those spiritual blessings, sometimes we think about heaven and the future, but realize this too, that those spiritual blessings we have in Christ are already ours now. You know, just the forgiveness of sins and the fruit of the Spirit, all those are spiritual blessings in Christ that, yes, we'll have fully someday, but even now we begin to understand that as we, we talk about the other blessings of the fruit of the Spirit, not wholly, not, not completely, not perfectly yet, but still God's working these things into us gradually by his Holy Spirit. So already now we lay claim to these treasures. Already now God is working within us his peace his perfect peace in and through Jesus Christ as the fruit of the Spirit. I'm just going to close this evening or this afternoon with the song that we, we sang earlier. I, I thought I'd put it so beautifully, so, so well. I couldn't say it any better. But that idea of stayed upon Jehovah, and there's that word, stayed, the idea of steadfast, unmoved, being still. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest, and I think it's the third stanza. Every joy or trial falleth from above, right? All the things we encounter come from God's hand, traced upon our dial by the Son of love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. They who trust him wholly find him wholly true. Amen. Let's pray together. Our God of peace, God of grace, we come before you this afternoon after the sermon thanking you for your word, for the word of encouragement, for the word of admonishment where needed. Father, for the peace that you give to us, we pray, Lord, that we would uh, trust in you fully and completely, that you would fill us with your peace, Father, that we would not doubt, that we would not turn ourselves over to uh, uh, being anxious about things and upset and even uh, responding in an ungodly way, but Lord, to be still, 
to be still and know that you are God and you will care for us because you've already given to us your son Jesus Christ and his righteousness and how much more won't you give to us all things in him. So Father, again, keep us strong in this and grant us your peace, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Join me now in our song of application. It's number